It's about time for our service to begin. Those of you who are visiting with us this night, we are especially glad you've chosen to be here. Before we start, I want to share from uh, our announcements this morning. Of course, Alicia Oosterman, uh, her and Chuck have been attending. She has decided to be part of the congregation here and in the bulletin you'll find not only their address but also uh, their phone number and uh, the names of their children. And also the Lawrence, as you'll notice in the bulletin, uh, they have new phone numbers as well. So you'll want to transfer those to your, your directory. Of course, we want to extend our sympathy to uh, the Thompson family and the Brom family for the loss of their their cousin in Kansas City. And then also, as I mentioned this morning, the, uh, the two-year-old that was uh, killed there at Willow Springs was also a relation uh, to them. So we need to keep them in, uh, in our prayers. Also on our prayer list, we wanted to add uh, Dustin Fluitt. Uh, Dustin has uh, colon cancer as well as in his lungs. Melva Steen also has terminal cancer, been asked to put on our prayer list. And of course, uh, Christy Johnson's uh, grandmother, Millie, we need to keep her on our, our prayer list. She's in the hospital yet, but doing as well as be expected. Okay, very good. And also, their son, Zach, uh, and his wife are about to be new parents, and we've been asked to put uh, them uh, on our prayer list. We know that the baby's going to be a boy, and we know the name's going to be Thomas. So add that to, uh, uh, to your prayer list. Have a thank you card. Uh, thank you to this great church uh, family uh, for the food, the offers to help during my treatments. All of your prayers have meant uh, the world to me. Your kindness will always be, be remembered. And Kathy King on the completion of her uh, cancer treatments. We're thankful for uh, her progress. We continue to pray and need to continue to pray for uh, her complete recovery and that this will not have any more effect uh, on her life. Also, uh, remember next Sunday, uh, daylight savings time returns. And finally, I, I forgot this morning, I was given a, or I, Ron actually asked me about the informational sheets that the elders had handed out uh, to turn those in to whom, and I talked to Clayton, Clayton said turn that in to one of the elders or to uh, Brother Rick. So those information sheets that's handed out and I'm assuming that there's still some of those sheets available if you need, uh, you need one of those, okay, on the table. But fill those out, the, uh, the elders would like to have your input and get that back to them as soon as, as possible. Also, a wedding uh, announcement, please join us for the wedding of Jeff Fisher and Stephanie Thomas, Saturday the 27th of May, 2023, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Green Forest Church of Christ, the township Line Road, Popular Bluff, Missouri. And I'll post this on the, uh, on the bulletin board. Is there anything that needs to be announced that I did not receive? If you would, please bow and we'll begin our, our service. Father, well, we're thankful to you for your goodness. We appreciate the fact, Father, that having been adopted into your family, that you've made a place for us, not only here, but, but hereafter. 
We would ask, Father, you help us in our, our service day to day as we live before you, that we might become more like your son, Jesus. Father, we, we appreciate the name that you've given us to wear, and we ask for help that we might wear it in a way that you would receive the glory and honor that you deserve. Realize, Father, there are things that many times we, we're hesitant to step out of our own little puddle in the world as it is. But we pray, Father, that you'll lead us and direct us through your word as you promised. And we pray, Father, that you'll help us to recognize those opportunities that you send our way. Help us, Father, when we recognize those, we'll, to the best of our ability, we will use those. And if we need help, Father, help us to, to reach out to our brothers and our sisters in order that we might use those opportunities to your glory. Father, forgive us of our sins and use us as you see fit in the kingdom. We love you and we humbly ask this through Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Good morning. Good evening. Morning. Yeah. I'm a little bit behind, aren't I? Our first song this evening will be number four. Number four, if you're using the books. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son to yield in his life and atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the promise of God to every believer, the promise of God. The vilest offenders who truly obey the moment they enter the Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher, and greater will be our moment, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. 
Next song will be number 792. Number 792. Following this song, we'll have our, our opening prayer. 792. <clears throat> My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I gracious father we thank you dear lord for this day this beautiful day you've given us father we can come together here without fear of persecution father to study another portion of your word father and sing songs to you and we thank you for that father we thank you for the many blessings you bestow upon us every day father and pray at this time that you would be with all our number father that are sick and could not be here we pray that you would be with the doctors administering to them father that they could have the health they once had Thank you, Father, for those who have returned and have been sick in health reasons, Father. We pray that they would continue to improve, Father. We pray that you would be with those of our number, Father, that are traveling. Be with them, Father, and see them back safely, Father, for the next appointed time, Father. Pray that you would be with those who have lost loved ones, and pray that you would comfort them, Father, as only you can. Pray that you would go with us through the rest of this service, Father, and guide, guard, and direct us. And See us back at the next appointed time. And as we pray in your son's holy name, amen. If you're using the books and you would like to mark your books at number 943 for the song after the lesson, number 943. And before the lesson, we'll sing number 508. Number 508. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, 
I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love. <coughs> and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand Good evening. We're glad you're here tonight. We've had several out sick, and it's good to see some of those folks back, but we've got more sick. Please keep them in your prayers. Seems like the stomach bug and the bronchitis and such is going around, and it's gotten some folks, but we're glad especially that we had a good attendance this morning, had a good fellowship meal together, and appreciate so much of you that offered up sacrifice of your goods and prosperity in order to help us as we move forward towards the, the ultimate goal that we've been talking about. And Terry, what, what's the date now, March 27th? The building will be brought to be established on the ground, and that will, Lord willing, provide us with great opportunities for the future, especially as we have more and more families working and worshiping with the congregation. Then the discussion with the elders last Thursday morning when we met with the elders, um, it was acknowledged that one of the best ways to pay for facilities is for more families to be here. And that's going to be our goal. More and more families. And, and I truly hope that in my lifetime that I'll see the congregation meeting in that building as an auditorium and, and be overflowing over there as well. Because that's important why but not because of the number that's on the board or even the amount of money that's contributed on a week-to-week -week basis but it's about lost souls and i hope that we can help populate heaven with a lot of marshfillians because of our love for the lord and serving him and our teaching the bible not only in the jail ministry but throughout our bible studies there are a lot of bible studies being conducted during the week please pray for those studies and the fruit that we can bear from those studies. And we thank you so much, all of you that are participating in those studies, those of you that are helping to encourage, sending the cards and letters, and the list goes on and on. But as you know, in our series on Sunday night, we've been talking about money matters. When I was a kid growing up in a congregation, I can't recall ever hearing much of a sermon on money. It's kind of one of those things everybody assumes everybody knows how to handle since we all can take it out of our... our um, purses, wallets, whatever we might have, or allowance money, we might stick in a pocket, we can handle it and say, oh, I know how to handle money. I know what to do with it. And when I was a kid, I did too, and that was spend it, right? We like the money, spend it, because we all need it. In Deuteronomy, we're using this for a basis for our text for this study, and that being that God gave instructions through Moses that they were to buy food with money. They had the means that they could purchase food, and they also could purchase drink. And then with the words that followed in verse 7, For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. And I think probably almost all of us can acknowledge that God has truly blessed His people financially and in prosperity and even with money, to the point that we have lived a lot of our lives without really going without. And I'm thankful that we have been blessed so well. But I wonder tonight, how many of you have ever given thought to, where does your money go? A few years ago, somebody had that thought, and they said, okay, what if we could track a dollar bill and see where it goes? And they came up with a website, and I know you probably can't see it on here. I'll try to blow this up. But it's, where's George? And the idea was you could go onto this website and you could register a dollar and then you would uh, put a stamp or write on the dollar bill uh, so that people could track it. 
and they would keep track of it on the website. And it was amazing what happened with the dollar bills that they were tracking because not only would they stay in an area and just keep circulating, you know, like in, you, you spend a dollar here in the city and it just stays here and just keeps cycling. But then sometimes the dollars would travel and sometimes all over the world, sometimes even around the world. And I searched to try to find out. I remember hearing about somebody that registered a dollar and it was gone for a long time, but then it came back and it was theirs again. I thought that was interesting. That just shows you the circle that, that money can go. And money lives in a circle in a sense. But a lot of folks, when you think about it, they really don't know where their money goes. But money travels. It travels in a circle which forms what is identified as an economy. And what is an economy? Well, it's the production and consumption of goods and services as a whole. It fulfills the needs of those living and operating within that economy. And we all understand that. This is no news to most of us. We understand that money flows. And when you stop that flow, things can get dangerous because people need the flow and they depend upon the flow. I heard just recently about a California bank um, going out of business. And that's a little bit spooky because they're a part of the circulation process. And especially problematic for those who may have had money in that bank. And of course, money's insured and that's all there. But we don't want, of course, all the banks failing and all that falling back to the taxpayer, do we? But that's another story. But here's something I want us to consider tonight as we look at money from the aspect we're going to approach it tonight. 65% of Americans have no idea how much they spent last month. And I want you to know, I'm going to raise my hand, not that I'm asking you to do so, but I'm one of those people who couldn't tell you what we spent and where it went. But it's controlled, because as Kathy says here, that's all you get. And my wife's a wonderful accountant. She took accounting in college, and I have been blessed by that because she does the accounting for the family. And she does an excellent job, and she's not a big spender. In fact, she doesn't like to spend any money. She knows where we spent the money. I don't. But what's tragic is, and in a lot of families in America, they don't really have an idea of how much money they spend. They don't know where their dollars that they receive, where it goes. They have no idea, and that's a problem. Because nearly a third of Americans surveyed said they wished they'd spent less in the last month. And then it goes on from there, the last month, the last month, the last month, the last month. Well, one of the problems Americans have is with controlling their spending. And because of their inabilities to watch where their money goes, to control their spending, money is the main source of stress for 73% of Americans. And that jumped from an original survey of 40-something percent up to now, and this is a current one, and that was conducted, 73% of Americans that were surveyed indicated that money was their chief source, main source of stress. Has money ever caused you stress? Well, it may not be having the money that caused you stress. It's maybe not having enough money that causes stress. And that creates a big problem when people don't have enough money to get by. When they've stretched to try to make ends meet, but they've stretched as far as it's going to stretch, and they're coming up short. And that creates a problem. And then unfortunately for some, it's easier to avoid facing the reality of finances and dealing with their money than to sit down and work out a budget and stick with that budget, work out a plan, maybe to get out of debt, in fact, a lot of folks don't ever think about a plan or think about what is necessary in order to have that budget to improve their situation so that they do not have so much stress. In Luke chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, we read the words in Scripture, He also said to His disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. 
And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. And so the, the rich man had a steward, a manager, but this manager was wasting goods. And so the rich man calls in the steward for an accounting. And then in verse 2 it says, So he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? And then he says, Give an account of your stewardship. For you can no longer be my steward. The word steward used in scripture here is a word in the original language which means a manager. And it's a compound word. One part of that is the house or the household. And the other part is the, that which is allotted for that house. Or in reality, the household management or manager. And so a steward was one who managed the household, or the business of, in this case, the rich man. And so he had responsibility as that business manager, as that steward, as that manager, to use whatever assets that were in his charge and not waste them. But he wasted his employer's goods. And that's not a good plan, is it? Unfortunately, a lot of Americans, we have a tendency to waste our goods, according to various surveys, people will spend without thinking, they'll get into debt without giving it proper thought, and so they're participating in the economy, but unfortunately they're not managing properly, and that is a problem because it doesn't lead to happiness in a prosperous household. It leads to that area of stress. It produces a lot of problems. And so when you look at Scripture, much is said about us being faithful. And even in a way when it comes to being faithful with reference to how we manage our money. And one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in very much, Jesus said in Luke 16, verse 10. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. And that's a problem for the, for the rich man when he's got a steward that's wasting his goods. And then notice verse 11. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? Managing money really involves personal discipline, doesn't it? To live a faithful Christian life, we know that we have to discipline ourselves and to walk orderly according to the Word of God, living faithfully and avoiding sin, fleeing those things are evil. But also we know that God gives us a responsibility to our families and to our giving to the church for the work of the church and meeting those needs that are presented there. And so we need to be faithful as stewards of God. As manager of what? Even of the money that flows, as we've talked about, in that circle of the economy. And sure, money flows in a circle, but if it's all flowing out, that creates a problem if we don't have enough of it left to pay our bills. And it's also interesting that this economy that we're talking about, according to Cambridge Dictionary, is defined as the system of making money and producing and distributing goods and services within a country or region. You see, God has set it up so we play a role in this economy. We don't often think about that, but yes, we as Christians, God's children, participate in an economy. For example, James talks about this in James chapter 4, verse 13. And speaking in reference to our dependence upon God. Come now, you say, today or tomorrow we will go in... We'll go to such a, such a city and spend a year there. And notice what we read. Buy, sell, and make a profit. Now that's describing who? A businessman who buys product, sells product, makes a profit. And that is an economy, an entrepreneurial money circle. And if you're buying products but you don't sell them, and you can't sell them for whatever reason, if your price is too high or you pay too much for them, certainly you're going to have a problem making a profit. And that could lead to a lot more problems. But as you think about this circle or cycle of economy, wherein we participate as Christians, 
One of the things that comes clear is that in order to spend money, you have to, number one, obtain money. In Matthew 20, in verse 8, in reference to a vineyard, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, his business manager, his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. How many in your lifetime of you have worked for wages? How many of you have paid wages? I've owned my own business. You pay wages. If you work for a business, you, pay, you receive wages. If you work for a company, you receive wages. If you work, you receive wages. That's God's design in this economy and world in which we live. And we have instructions about the importance of earning or obtaining money. In fact, John 4, verse 36, we read the words, and he who reaps receives wages. That's just a fact, almost, we can say a fact of life. Well, it's a fact within the economy. In order to be able to circle with an economy in dollars, we have to earn those dollars, which means we obtain money. Now, how many of you have ever found money? And what's the most you've ever found? For me, it was a $20 bill. And it was in such a position there was no way I could have ever found out to who to give it back to so I felt good about that otherwise I'd tried to give it back but twenty dollars and I was pretty young at the age and I thought I'm rich why because I was going to participate in the economy with my newfound twenty dollar bill and I was going to Send that out like sending out a dollar. Where's George? I really didn't care where it went. I just cared for what it was going to bring me. And then sometimes we obtain money by receiving a gift of money. How many of you, when you were younger, received allowance, adults? How many of you young people get an allowance? Yeah? How many of you wished you would get an allowance? Okay, parents, you're seeing that. But then sometimes we get an inheritance. Occasionally we have rich uncles that pass away and they give us money. And with that gift of money, that allows us to participate in the economy. Then sometimes we are blessed in that inheritance to have an asset. Lots of times children will inherit maybe a farm from, from a parent or a grandparent or a rich uncle and then they'll turn around and sell that farm for money, so they can participate in that economy. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work out sometimes as good as it should. It's like winning the lottery. We'll talk about that later. Sometimes you don't, if you happen to do that, it doesn't work out very good. And I'm not going to encourage you to do that because that's really not the way God intends for us to obtain money. We obtain money by earning money. And if we get it by finding or we receive an inheritance or even allowance, that's good. And, and I like the fact that my parents would tell us that you have to earn this money, so get out there and clean the yard up or mow wherever they told us to do, pick the garden, clean the garden, remove the weeds. And I like that concept because I had younger brothers. I said, okay, come on. And I'd lead them out there and say, here's what you're doing. I'm going to watch you. So I got to be the manager. But we all got the allowance, and that was good, because we felt like we're still earning money. If you've met all my younger brothers, you knew I did when I managed them. Well, we earn money, whether we labor for it, whether we're in business, or even invest it. And I didn't put that on here, but sometimes we do well investing money, like this buy, sell, and get gain. Folks can do well that way as they participate in the economy. And as the scripture does say in 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Folks who get out and work, here's some folks working in the field, and they're dressed like in biblical times, and they took this picture, and they're out working the vineyard. What do they expect? They expect the wages so they can participate in the circle of their economy. But sometimes there is problems with obtaining money. It could be because there's simply a lack of work. We've seen times in America where it was really difficult to get a job and to earn money. And that meant a lot of people became entrepreneurs that didn't really see that as an option, but they were forced to, and it worked out really good. 
because they had struggled trying to find a job. And sometimes things happen where we're unable to work physically or even mentally because we're no longer physically able to do it. And so we're not able to produce, to earn money for whatever reason, whether it be medical or otherwise. And then sometimes we get stuck in a position where we just are in low-wage jobs that just do not provide enough for us to make ends meet. And that creates its own problems, and that's a problem in our having the money. You know, we earn it, it's, it's not enough. And then sometimes we're just not productive. How many of you have been to business that just didn't work? Or you had a job you thought was going to pay you well, maybe they're paying you on commission, selling products or whatever, it didn't work out. And then sometimes we just choose to be unproductive. But then it gets down to a choice sometimes people make, and that's to work. And Proverbs 6 addresses that problem, and I love this passage of Scripture, this wisdom from, from God. Verse 6 reads, Go to the ant. Have you ever sat and just watched ants work? It's kind of fascinating. Maybe you've had an ant farm. But go to the ant, you lazy one. Observe its ways and be wise. Which, having no chief officer or ruler, prepares its food in the summer, gathers its provisions in the harvest. And in verse 9, how long will you lie down, you lazy one? And he's saying, if you're lazy, you're not like this ant, because they're not. Will you arise from your sleep, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest? Well, I will go to work, but later. Well, there's days I have those days. Yeah, I know I didn't get this done, but uh, let me just, cat kept me up all night. I'm going to sleep with this another hour. And that's probably, probably what I am probably going to do tomorrow, by the way. Verse 11, then your poverty. See, here's the problem. If you have a problem because of a failure to work or even with the other options, poverty will come. Because it takes so much money, a certain level of money for us to be able to participate in the, in the economy and make sure that everything is taken care of, our needs are taken care of. Then your poverty says will come in like a drifter and your need like an armed man. Have you ever looked at the end of the month and hear check balance and say, I've been robbed? It happens. But in this circle of the economy, one of the greatest things that we can do is, of course, earn money. But secondly, in the circle, we make sure in that circle we honor God. And he needs to come first. We read the words in verse 9 of Proverbs 3, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Verse 10, So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. What do we do? We place God first in our lives. And as we think about this economy where God blesses us and we participate, God needs to be honored first. What does that mean? We're going to give to God first because He's the one that blesses us. And so the instructions of 2 Corinthians 9 7, let each one give as He purposes in His heart. What is that purpose in, of the giving? It's to honor God, not grudge and necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And when we give, we honor the Almighty God who has given us. So much, as 2 Corinthians 8, 1 tells us. Think about what God does when he blesses his people. In verse 2, that in great trial of affliction, those who are willing to give gave out of abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. What did they do? They put God first of that which they obtained. And then unfortunately, in this circle of the economy, we, we earn, God comes first, and then who's standing right there with their hand out? In fact, some of you already know about the handout before you even get your paycheck. And then when the first thing you see when you open the paycheck, even before you've given as you've prospered, you notice tax, tax, tax. For a while in America, there were folks who decided they didn't like that, and they weren't going to participate in that part of the economy. And so they decided it was not legal to pay their taxes, so they weren't going to do it. Well, it's interesting that Jesus has a question posed to him, isn't it? Is it lawful to pay taxes 
Of course, they're saying to Caesar, because that's where ultimately taxes would go to Rome. So is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. And that sets the priorities, doesn't it? We honor God, but yes, we pay taxes. Romans 13, 6, because of this, you also pay taxes. Why? What God has set up in government. It's by God's design. And they have a place in this cycle of economy. And I don't like it necessarily because I see money being wasted. I see money of government going to things that I don't appreciate and stand for. And the list goes on and on. But yet I know biblically we are still under obligation to pay what is due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Custom to whom customs do, fear to whom fear, honor, and to whom honor. And so we live with taxes. But then we get down to this, number four. After we earn it, put God first, honor Him, then we pay our taxes. What's left we can spend, right? It's in our trust. We are now stewards of that money to spend. It's like in Deuteronomy. Take the money in your hand. When I was a kid, I loved money in my hand. And then I love what we read in verse 26. And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires. Of course, this is in reference to tithing, traveling to a place. But nevertheless... The concept of taking money into your hand is there, as well as spending with reference to what you desire, your heart desires. Now, think back when some of you, and I know some of you remember this, you went to the grocery store, it looked like this. Do you remember a store like this? There was one in Lebanon uh, downtown, just out off of downtown, that was a whole lot like this. When I was a kid growing up, they had a grocery store called Homeland Grocery on Division Street. Out at Elkland, they had a um, grocery store out there that was pretty much looked just like this, Elvin Gann's Grocery. And when I met Kathy, it still looked like this. But when you're a kid and going to a place like this, and you run across this section, and it seemed like it was a big one, so it was great. And here's all this candy that your parents wouldn't buy for you. You got your money in your hand. And what are you going to do? Walk away from that and not buy any candy? Well, sometimes maybe because you see the toys, toys over here somewhere. Or you got some other right plan for it. But I remember when I went there to pick out the best candy I could find for my money. And back then, 10 cents would buy a lot. Money was in hand, and you spent it for what your heart desires. Now it's a little bit more like this. Kids get money, and they head to places where they can buy toys. Water pistols and all sorts of cool stuff. They got toys now that do everything, including drive you around the yard and out in the street when you're not supposed to, when the battery's charged on those vehicles. And they even got four-wheelers, I understand now, Jeep-looking things. But, it, but the idea of spending money now is, of course, the same in concept. Because even back then, and your young people, your parents and grandparents will probably remember, when they went as a young person to spend their money, they'd bring out and they were proud of what they got. You know, if it was a candy bar that was this big or this big, it didn't matter if it was one of those jawbreakers that last 12 weeks. It didn't matter. They were proud of it. We were proud of whatever we got, but our parents said, and I can still hear my mom, well, why in the world did you spend your money on that? Parents, how many of you remember saying it? Kathy's looking up in the air, uh-oh. Why'd you spend the money? Well, it's interesting, Isaiah 55, verse 2, Questions posed, why do you spend your money for what is not bread? In other words, what's not necessary or essential? And your wages for that which does not, or for what does not satisfy. Well, we kind of learned as kids, sometimes those things we bought didn't really 
do much for us. Basically, when they broke, you know, stuff made from, in Japan at that time wasn't very reliable, or it didn't seem to have as much fun as we thought we were going to have with it, or we did something with it and our parents took it away from us. So it wasn't the happiness we thought. But it is a, it's an important question. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Because you see, that's one of the problems as we near the end of this study that I wanted to point out. Because people, even adult people, spend a lot of money in this economy we live. And they are able to do so because of those little plastic cards. Do y'all have some of those? It makes it real easy. And we can spin, 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 and on TV, and on the internet, and on the ads, and newspaper, radio, wherever. There's all these ads that said, you need this. And you think, I got the plastic. I can spin, spin, spin. And it's going to satisfy me. And, it's, and you know, those things are necessary. I need that new gun because I might go hunting and we might be hungry and I'll have to kill a deer and eat. And it's pretty too. And when I shoot, it's going to shoot straight as an arrow instead of crooked like my old one. And that's just an example. It's okay to buy guns, of course. Anything we buy is okay in essence as long as it's right and moral and pure and not something that is evil. But yet, even on good things, is what I'm saying, we can overspend. I told Kathy, our TV's too small in the living room because we're getting older. She said, we don't need a bigger TV. But yeah, Kathy, it's got the latest stuff. You can talk to it. It's great. It looked really good in our living room. So when you walk in, that's all you see. Spin, spin, spin. And we got some of those cards and we can just pay for it. And so what happens to Americans, including members of the church, is we fall victim to building a lot of non-essential debt. There is sometimes what we can label as essential debt because we have to buy homes. And it's very difficult for us to save up the amount of money today that it takes in Marshfield to buy a home with average prices between two and 300000 We understand that. And while I recommend saving money to buy a new car, sometimes folks decide to go ahead and they got the money, they can pay the payment, and they'll go ahead and buy a new car because their old one's falling apart and they need something. Very, and, and, and we understand that. But it's interesting, it's not really those things that cause the problems for many households in America. It's not those things that create the stress. So it might be paying them, but it's not really those things that, that cause the problem. It's because of the massive non-essential debt that people build up on their plastic cards that puts them into trouble. And there's no better passage to, to remember than Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrow is a servant to the lender. If you look at like the New American Standard Version, it reads, the borrower becomes the lender's slave. And if you've been in credit card debt or if you're there now, you know the reality of that. Or if you have student loans, I know that's another challenging problem uh, of, of debt. Young people are forced to borrow money for their education and that can create a real problem and cause a lot of stress. But that can be argued as being essential. And education is very, very important and can be very helpful and prosperous to a family. But again, that's not the debt that's really the biggest problem. It's that ability to buy the bigger TVs. Oh, I'd like to have that. That'd look really good in the house. And, you know, I sat in that chair, and that, that chair is just getting where it don't sit comfortable at all. And they got this one on sale, so I think we ought to buy a couple of those. And y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? It's very easy to become a victim. And the problem with the plastic, and I know they're going to probably send me an email saying, you don't talk about that on, on Facebook, but the truth's the truth. How many of you know what interest is charged today on a credit card? Well, the average right now, and this is February 21st, 2023, from where the data comes from, 20.4%. Wow. 
Most people do not know that. And they get their bills from where they've bought with the plastic, non-essential items, gone into debt for it. They don't, one, realize how much interest is on that debt, but also they only pay the minimum payment. And you might be thinking, Rick, this is not the preacher's job to teach people how to spend money. Well, folks, we could study a long time on what the Bible says about money. It is important because I don't want you stressed out. I want you serving God with the great joy in your heart. And I want you to be able to enjoy what it means to be able to give like you've been to giving. Because many of you know what it means to be cheerful givers. But unfortunately, when we serve as debt and that debt keeps increasing, 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 it creates stress, stress, stress. And it puts a strain on a family's economy as well as even a nation's economy. Because we're under obligation. Scripture tells us we have responsibility to pay debt. I love what we read in 1 Kings, and I won't spend a lot of time there because our time's up, but it's the story of a situation where there was a need. And this woman comes and, and she tells the man of God, of the challenges in, in her life. And he said to her in 2 Kings 4, go and sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. I don't know if you have had the privilege of reading some of the books that are out about how to manage debt, how to get out of debt, so forth. Dave Ramsey's program does a good job teaching people how to not stay in debt, how to get out of debt, and so forth. We were, I was privileged there in uh, Hardy, Arkansas to work with one of our brothers who was trained to teach that, and I helped him teach a class to the community. We had a good number of members of the church there as well as the community. But it was simple. What we taught them was this. Pay your debt, live on the rest. And provided them some ways to make that happen. Why? Because 73% of Americans rank finances as their number one stress in life. And this came from Capital One Credit Wise Survey, December 29, 2022. How many of you have received envelopes in the mail that just stressed you out to no end because on that envelope it says past due? And you go, oh no. Sure, that can't be right. And then you find, oh no, it is. Or you get an envelope that says final notice on the inside. And you go, what? I don't remember not paying that. It happens. And sometimes that happens because we're so far in debt, we become slaves to debt to the point we can't pay our bills. And what do people do when it comes to being so far in debt because they've overspent with reference to what should go to God to honor Him? We know, don't we? And that's not what God wants. But I'm going to close with this. The number two cause of divorces in the United States is financial problems and debt. Does that stress affect a relationship? Does it affect a family? Does it affect a family with children? Do children also have to suffer? Yes. Next Lord's Day, Sunday evening, if all goes well, we're going to look at some other problems of the cycle of money that we've been talking about we introduced tonight, including a plan to conquer debt. And if you are struggling with debt or you know somebody that is, I want to encourage you to invite them to be with you next Sunday night. Or if you know someone's not here that they may not know about that lesson, I want to encourage you to do that because truly it is something people need to know. And I want to share with you some ways the Bible talks about you and I can conquer debt. But tonight, most importantly, I want to point out in James chapter 4, verse 13, verse 14, the truth is, whatever plans we lay down, we should know we don't know what's going to happen on tomorrow. That's why tonight we're going to offer the invitation to you. If your life is not right with the Lord, you don't know about tomorrow. 
And so please consider that as we stand and sing, would you come? How's that? That's on that. Um, may I see the hands who would like to be served the communion this evening? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your son. Father, we realize that he was willing to be that sacrifice that we might have the hope of eternal life. For there's these partake of this bread that represents your son's body. May they do so in a way pleasing in thy sight. In your son's name, amen. Father, again, we thank you for your great love that you were willing to sacrifice your son on our behalf. 
Father, we realize that it was the shedding of his blood that purchased our salvation. Father, for those who would take of this, we ask that they do so in a way pleasing in thy sight. In your son's name, amen. Now may I bring a contribution plate to anyone? <clears throat> Father, at this time we would especially thank you for all those physical things you do for us, for our jobs, our way of making a living. Father, for the very clothing and housing that we have. Father, help us to understand that you give to us freely and that you ask that we give back. In your son's name, amen. Thank you for your help. I want to thank everyone for being here this evening. And in closing, I'd like to uh, sing number 752. If you will all stand for the song and then the prayer to follow, we'll close with a prayer following the song. This is my daily prayer. God bless you, go with God. Hold fast his mighty hand throughout the day. His grace your heart sustain. His power pain, your prayer be not in vain, as you travel his way, in spite of all the lies that some may hurl, Christ is the Oh. Uh...
of all the world. God bless you, go with God through all eternity. My prayer will always be. May you go with God. May you go with God. Amen. We bow to him, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have to come together and worship you and hear a portion of your word. Father, we're thankful for Brother Rick and for the elders and their ability and leadership in this congregation. And we just ask you to be with them and continue to guide us in a manner that is pleasing to you. Father, we ask you to be with those people that are on our sick list and that they may be brought back to their most wanted health and they'll be able to re rejoin us once again to worship you. Father, we ask that as we prepare to leave this place, that you'll bring us back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.